the latest tech. I'm Alexa. I can answer your questions. Interviews. And we are evolving and we are seeing an amazing opportunity that's happening. Accessibility. Accessibility is, is one of our core values. It's even a part of our mission statement. This is Double Tap TV. Happy New Year, everybody. I hope you had an amazing holiday break this year. Welcome to the first edition of Double Tap TV for 2022. It's going to be a really exciting year. We've got some great shows lined up for you, including our one-hour CES 2022 special airing next week here at this time. We are in birthday celebration mode and World Braille Day is here. So we're going to celebrate. If you guys want to get involved, send us an email. It's feedback at ami.ca or you can follow us on Twitter at Double Tap Canada. And if you've got a question for us, don't forget to use that hashtag, which is Ask Double Tap. I am Marco Flalo and Stephen Scott is by my side each and every single week live from Glasgow, Scotland. Stephen, World Braille Day. What exactly are we celebrating here? Is it just because it's Louis Braille's birthday? Uh, well, you know, I thought we were celebrating the fact that I had just turned 40 at the end of last year, Mark. Uh, clearly, you've moved on. Yeah, I forgot that. about that. Yeah, no. Well, I'm actually in mourning at the minute. I'm wearing my black T-shirt today in mourning for my 40 previous years um, and, and no doubt the 40 to come. Um, but yes, World Braille Day, far more important. Uh, Louis Braille's birthday, of course. Yeah, a, a very significant date in the calendar for many people. Uh, you know, Louis Braille... Uh, was the man who invented the Braille code, which unfortunately he didn't even see uh, become uh, the, the Braille uh, language that has become the useful tool, the ability essentially for blind and partially sighted people to be literate in today's society. He didn't even see that come to fruition in his own lifetime. People laughed at the prospect of Braille. But, you know, ultimately it did become a language of its own and indeed a, a way, a means of communication for many blind people and a way of being, as I say, literate, which is the key. You know, essentially reading and writing is what Braille is to blind people. That is the same thing. And that is how important it is. And it is just as important in 2022 as it was when Louis Braille was alive. I think this is a misconception, Stephen, that anybody with a visual impairment just knows how to read Braille. That's not the case. You only started learning it a couple of years ago, right? Absolutely, and I'm not alone. In fact, many people never learn Braille. And it's interesting, the number of people who learn Braille and actually use Braille it is very small. The numbers are small. Uh, in fact, there's an interesting statistic from 1960 done by the National Federation of the, the Blind when they surveyed blind people back in the 60s. You were looking at around 58% of uh, children learning Braille at that time. Now it's down to 10%. Just in the last five, 10 years that survey taken, uh, only 10% of blind and partially sighted children are learning Braille. So, you know, th this is a big problem here. It's not being taught in schools as much as perhaps it should have. And in my own experience, that was certainly the case. I was discouraged from learning Braille and in favour taught to learn to use audio technology or text-to-speech technology, which, you know, is what I use today, the, the JAWS screen reader, essentially, which is great. But, you know, I still need to know how words form, how sentences form, how, how words on a page appear. That's important. And that's what Braille's about. What kind of advantages do you think you have now having learnt Braille? I know that you're not up to snuff in terms of the level of other people's reading of Braille, but do you think you have an advantage over other people because you know how to read it? I think it's different when you're older. You know, when, when you start learning at an older age, it's very different to what I would have learned had I started at a young age. Now, interestingly, I did learn grade one Braille. Now, grade one is essentially the alphabet. Uh, and I learned that at school through, through a teacher who was actually learning herself. She was teaching or going on to teach Braille to students and she wanted to use me as a guinea pig. And that's the only reason I got the opportunity to learn it. I wish I had gotten to grade two. Grade one is what they call contracted Braille, where essentially a number of characters become one and it makes the amount of Braille on one line equal more words on the, on the line. So essentially shrinking down the amount of Braille you would have to read and it allows you therefore to read faster. Uh, the advantages for someone like me is the ability to, for example, when we were on the cruise recently, uh, last year we had a lovely time on a cruise, it was nice to know what floor we were going to with the lift rather than just randomly ho poking buttons and waiting for the, the announcement to tell us we were on the ninth floor and then try and work out what button that was we'd press to get to the 14th. You know, actually being able to read the Braille, read the Braille inside the ship to know what was on the floor, what was actually there, what, what we were walking towards. Because there's so much Braille around, in these settings, it's good to be able to do that, to take quick notes, to label plugs, 
uh, on the wall to know what things are that connected up. So you don't have to pull a plug out and chase a cable. You can just literally just feel the, the Braille dots and figure out what it is. You know, I, there's so many applications for Braille. Not necessarily to sit down at my age and read War and Peace, because it would take me as long as it took to write War and Peace to read it. But ultimately, uh, you know, it's those little things through the day that make my life easier with Braille. And also it keeps me literate, which is something that I really do value. As you lose vision, you know, I always think back to the, the film Back to the Future. And you might remember, Mark, in one particular scene, there's an image where uh, as Mar Marty's back in the future, he or back in the past, I guess it is, he's... Um, looking at an image of his family from the future. And because he's making changes to his world, the images of the people are changing. They're disappearing from the photo, leaving perhaps just him and someone else. And all his other family members have disappeared out of the image. That's what words are like to me now. The, the letters and the words are disappearing. So I'm forgetting how to spell. And, you know, that's where Braille is so important. And actually being able to read a, a page and actually, you know, see uh, or feel, arguably, how a word is spelled out really makes a difference. Yeah, you know, Stephen, next week on the show, we're going to be covering all things CES. We're going to be here with you at the same time, but we're going to be with you for an hour because there are lots of things to cover, including the makers of the Braille display, or well, one maker of Braille displays, and that's the American Printing House for the Blind. So after a quick break, we're going to actually dial them up a little bit early before CES because I want to find out what their thoughts are on the state of Braille in 2022. If you guys want to get involved, it's feedback at ami.ca. And of course, on Twitter, if you're following us, it's at Double Tap Canada with the hashtag Ask Double Tap. We're going to talk to them and a very, very cool feature from Grant Hardy after this break. Stick around. For more great Double Tap TV content, visit ami.ca slash Double Tap. This is Double Tap TV. We're back on Double Tap TV in full celebration mode. Break out the candles, the confetti poppers, and say happy birthday to Louis Braille, and let's help celebrate World Braille Day with us. I am Marco Flalo, and I could not be here without Stephen Scott by my side. Stephen, what do you think Louis Braille would say today if he could witness all the technology around us that's taking his language and bringing it to all these new heights? I think uh, Louis Braille would be in tears of joy, quite frankly. Uh, because, you know, despite what I said earlier about the number of blind people who are learning, blind children who are learning Braille today, I will say there's been a massive sea change. Uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges, there's, there's two challenges essentially that exist when it comes to uh, learning Braille and actually people, not just children, but anybody reading Braille. And that is the education part, the number of people who are actually being taught it at school. That's one challenge. But secondly, it's the cost of the technology. And the technology cost is is high. You know, for a Braille display, you're looking in the region of four, uh, sometimes five or even six, even beyond that, thousand dollars. You know, we're not talking a little bit of money here. You know, you think about if you were going out tomorrow, Mark, to buy a new keyboard for your computer, right? If I was saying to you, uh, like, okay, what, what keyboard are you going to get? You'd be like, well, I'll get the Logitech or I'll get whatever. It might cost me 200 bucks or $150 or whatever. I'd be saying, well, I am, I'm going to go and get a Braille version. It's going to cost me $5,000. You'd be like, what? And that's unfortunately the reality we're still in today. Now, there are lower cost options coming along. We've seen products like the Orbit uh, Reader uh, 20 and then now the Orbit Reader 40 as well come out. And these products are much lower cost, which is good news, better, uh, better entry point. Uh, for many people, but we're even seeing the technology that we buy every day having the capability to input Braille. For example, the humble iPhone. The iPhone has a built-in Braille screen input on the device, so I can just use my fingers in the Perkins style, the way I would with a Braille display or with a Perkins Brailler, and input that Braille onto that device. I have it on Android phones as well. Um, you can even get an app, a brilliant app for Windows, called Perky Duck. Hilarious name, uh, but Perky Duck brilliant app. It works just like a notepad uh, on your Windows desktop. So you just open up Perky Duck and just like notepad, you go in, you start typing away using the uh, the SDF and the JKL keys as your Perkin keys on a QWERTY keyboard. So if you can't afford a Perkins, because they're quite expensive, if you can't afford the Braille display, you can use Perky Duck. Uh, you know, there are different ways to do it. 
and read that information back, which is brilliant. So the technology is getting cheaper, so that's helping. And that is why I think Louis Braille is, is certainly going to be, uh, would have been happy if he'd been here. So let's talk a little bit about Louis Braille a little bit more in a little bit more detail. Grant Hardy is here, Double Tap TV contributor, and he's looking back at Louis Braille himself, the man, and, and what his legacy is all about and what it would mean if he was here today. Hey, am I Vancouver Bureau reporter and Double Tap contributor Grant Hardy here. I've been blind since birth, and whether I'm reading the latest thriller, taking notes at work, or reading the buttons in an elevator, I use Braille, the system of raised dots for reading and writing that's become the ubiquitous, essential window to the world for literacy, education, and employment for people who are blind. So I wanted to talk to Dr. Kay Holbrook, professor at the University of British Columbia, to find out more about the genius who invented Braille, Louis Braille. So Louis Braille was born in what was at the time a very rural village. Now it would be considered a suburb of, of Paris. And he went blind when he was um, very young, two or three years old, as a result of an accident in his father's saddlery shop. And through a variety of events, he got a scholarship to the Paris School for the Blind, where they were doing some innovative work in, ed in the education of individuals um, young young children who were blind or visually impaired. And so he became, he was really a pioneer in the development of the, of the Braille system that we uh, use almost, almost um, the same system that he developed when he was very young. Uh, and he developed it because he needed it and his classmates needed it. Given the generally negative attitude towards blindness and visual impairment in the past, Louis Braille was truly way ahead of his time. What's really striking to Kay is his determination. I can't believe that as a young child in a time where this kind of thing was not accepted, really, he was able to go past that and to develop something that was that's really been lasting for over 200 years even today people who are who are innovating new technologies new ways of doing things new strategies are also that kind of creative they they imagine something that doesn't exist and they work to try and make that exist there's no doubt about it Louis Braille didn't know that computers would exist in the future, or blindness-specific tablets, or even elevators. But he did know one thing. Just like for the sighted world, a simple, consistent way to read and write letters is the key to independence and success. I wouldn't be where I am today without Louis Braille and the system of raised dots named after him. I can't wait to see where the system of Braille goes next. That's Grant Hardy there. Thank you, Grant. And uh, really insightful to learn a bit more about Louis Bro's past, his history, and indeed his legacy mark, which is uh, something that a lot of people will be talking about today and I hope we'll continue talking about in the future. Coming up, we're bringing on a company who will be featured on our CES episode next week. But given our conversation about Braille, we wanted to bring them on a little bit early to find out what they think about the state of Braille, and that is the American Printing House for the Blind. Get involved, get in touch, feedback at ami.ca, of course, our email address on Twitter, at DoubleTapCanada. Use that hashtag, which is AskDoubleTap. We'll be back in a moment. For more great Double Tap TV content, visit ami.ca slash Double Tap. This is Double Tap TV. Welcome back to Double Tap TV, talking all things World Braille Day and celebrating not only that, but also Louis Braille's birthday. I am Marco Flalo with Stephen Scott by my side. Special thanks to Grant Hardy for putting that piece together for us. That was amazing, Stephen. Uh, but coming up now, uh, a very cool company that's going to be featured in our hour-long CES special next week. And that company is the American Printing House for the Blind. We decided to catch up with them a little early because, of course, this is World Braille Day. That's right, Mark. We got a chance to talk to Greg Stilson, who is uh, the head of Global Technology Innovation, a huge title at American Printing House for the Blind. They talked to us about the 
uh, work they've done with companies like Humanware and others to uh, make more technology, more Braille technology in particular, accessible to as many blind children and blind people as possible. And I wanted to first off ask Greg about his thoughts on the relevance of Braille in 2022. It's a it's a it's a question that I think is on a lot of people's minds as um, the text to speech offerings become more mainstream. When you see voice assistants and people br uh, browsing, you know, shopping experiences with their their voice only and getting text to speech feedback and things like that, as you see that brought into the mainstream, um, you know, you see that or you hear that question brought up even by main, uh, a lot of mainstream people of how, why do you need to read Braille if, if I can just listen to an audio book? And, you know, the, the, the recognition of, of things like spelling and, and sentence structure and punctuation and, 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 you know, all, when I, when I bring that up to a, a sighted audience, you know, they immediately get it because they understand how reading the written word has affected them and their comprehension and their ability to, to, you know, read and write and, and communicate effectively. Uh, they understand how, you know, literacy has, has allowed them to do that, but it's really easy. The more technology and voice assistance and, and text to speech offerings that you see for people to forget that is so intricate part of, of education. And, Braille is the solution for that. Braille is what gives a blind person that um, ability to understand things like sentence structure and spelling and punctuation. And and APH has a Braille roadmap. Um, you know, we've we've really focused a lot on um, upping the ante with regards to uh, intelligent Braille displays. Mantis being sort of the 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 first example here. It's where Braille displays used to be. You know great when they're connected to another tool they used to be a very expensive paperweight when not connected to that tool right and now today with devices like the mantis um you know having a a, a basic editor and a, a calculator and a book reader um and even embedded wi-fi so you can download updates or download books directly to the device um braille displays aren't just this connect connected only device now they they have intelligence and, uh, and and productivity tools that even when they're disconnected from a computer or, or a, a mobile device, there's there's value there. There's this concept of, I guess, the holy grail or the holy braille device, actually, as it might be. Uh, you know, the idea that you have the ability to read from this, but also get tactile images as well. And I know this is something that you've been uh, keen to work on. Uh, we've seen other projects working on this around the world as well. Uh, tell us about that. You're working on something uh, actually right now, aren't you? You know, APH is going to release a product. Um, you know, our, our timeline is hopefully end of 2023. Um, but there's so many unknowns in this project. We're trying to do something that's just never been done before. Uh, and so, you know, our, our that's our on the paper timeline. But unfortunately, with all of the supply chain issues and everything else that are happening, we never know what's going to happen. So. Having said all this, I hope APH is, is, you know, one of the first to release a product that is really focused on solving this problem. But I also hope that APH is not the last. Being a not-for-profit non company, um, our job, one of our main mission goals here is to stimulate in innovation in this space, right? And so if APH can start the wave of these type of products, because I can tell you, you know, for-profit companies are going to hopefully come up with products that are cheaper, easier to produce, and uh, and and hopefully more innovative than what we're gonna what we're gonna release. But it, you know the way that I tell my team all the time is it has to start with somebody, right? Somebody has to release this this product and 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 start this new category of technology. We'll hear more from Greg Stilson next week on our hour long CES 2022 special because Stephen, they're one of uh, many companies who are in the accessibility, I guess you'd say, you know, section of CES 2022. Although it's a little smaller this year because the event is virtual. But I, I guess you know, in wrapping up this episode, and and again, thank you to Greg for being here, and thank you for Grant Hardy for putting that great piece together. I have to I have to look to you and say, you know, what would you hope that the future of Braille really is? Is it really that holy grail of, of this devices that allows us to have tactile feedback for everything in our world? It's a really difficult question because ultimately what you want is something that is mainstream enough to provide the Braille that we need. Um, 
in a more affordable package. And I, you know, I don't know, and I think I share Greg's view on this, that, and we get into a huge amount of detail and conversation on this, and we'll hear more as you say next week, but I just don't know if we'll ever get that from a company like Apple or Google. It will always be, I think, Braille, under the term specialist, because it kind of has to be. Um, this is not something that anybody can or should use or would use necessarily. It's for blind people, right? This is for blind people. And in a world where we try and mainstream everything and try and put everything under the banner of, in quotes, normal, um, that's quite difficult to do with something like this. I, I think ultimately what I'm looking for is more people to learn Braille. So, you know, let's get more people training, educating, understanding about Braille, making Braille, you know, a real part of a child's development and encouraging people who are older, who perhaps are losing their sight, to have a go at it. It's not saying it's for everybody, and certainly not suggesting for a second it's all about reading. It's sometimes, as I said earlier, about making notes, um, about identifying products around the home. That's where these devices, uh, that's where this technology can be really useful. Even with that simple Dymo Braille labeler. Yes, you can get those as well. A Braille labeler from Dymo that's all about Braille. Um, you know, and that's a great product to have. Um, you know, the more we have, the better, right? The more tools we have in our arsenal, it's better for employment, for continuing employment in older age and certainly at younger age. Uh, so, you know, what I'm looking for, my holy grail, holy grail, if you want, is, you know, something that's affordable, uh, that's available to as many people as possible. We're getting there, but there's still much more work to be done. Well, we're going to follow this and uh, maybe some things will come up next week on our CES show. So uh, do tune in, uh, CES special next week, one hour special, all about CES 2022. We'll talk about, of course, mainstream stuff, some more assistive stuff. Lots of really cool things are coming up next week. Thank you guys so much for being with us this week. Again, if you want to get in touch, feedback at AMI.ca is our email address on Twitter. If you're not following us already, what are you waiting for? It's at Double Tap Canada and use that hashtag, which is Ask Double Tap to, uh, to get our attention. On behalf of our guests and Stephen Scott this week, I am Marka Flalo. We will speak to you again next week on Double Tap TV. Hosted by Marka Flalo and Stephen Scott. Editing Jordan Steves and Marka Flalo. Voiceover Anna Vicino. Integrated Described Video Specialist Ron Rickford. Coordinating Producer Jennifer Johnson. Director Production Kara Nye. Director Programming Brian Perdue. VP Content Development and Programming John Melville. President and CEO David Arrington. Copyright 2022 Accessible Media Inc.